But hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Catalyst Story Session, World Building. I'm your host and director of Mentoring and Partnerships, Jennifer Plotsky, and our guest today is Sarah Kogan. Sarah is a film and TV designer with over 16 mm -hmm. years of experience, helping up-and-coming filmmakers realize their creative vision through film design and world building so they get more bang for their buck. She's also the creator of the course World Building and Budgeting for Your Creative Vision Masterclass. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, for having me. So, oh my gosh, such a pleasure. I'm excited to talk about this. We have uh, a lot to cover because I, this is such a fascinating field for me. Um, so let's dive right in. Uh, what, when we talk about design and world building, let's just, you know, bottom line overview here. Like what exactly does that mean? So uh, costume design, or sorry, world building and film design and what that means. So first off, Let's talk about the definition of design. I think that's important to cover. Mm -hmm. So design is to craft a plan or a drawing of something that is then to be built and created by everyone else. So as a filmmaker, when you are doing your film's design, you are coming up with the plan to then execute with your creatives and with your design, with your de department heads for your film. So when I talk about film design, I am actually talking about what I call layers two through four of the storytelling um, within film. So there's the first layer of storytelling in film is your script. It is your, you know, that's your foundation. It is your plot, your driving thing. And we're always going to go back to our scripts and review that again and again and again. Um, but that's where we get story type. What kind of type of story are we telling? Is it an action? Is it a thriller, a rom-com? That's at the script level. And that can only really be answered at the script level. And then every decision is based off of that. Whereas the second layer of storytelling is the world building. That's the physical three-dimensional world in which our characters are going to literally go in. You know, we're going to craft and create with our, with our crew. Um, and we're going to literally inhabit this three-dimensional space with our cast, with our crew during the shooting process. It is all about, um, it's what I call genre. It's where we see that come out, right? So is it a fantasy? Is it a, a sci-fi contemporary period? We're going to see that at that second layer of storytelling within film. And, you know, and that's all the physical stuff of costumes, hair, makeup, production design, uh, sound design, um, and other atmospheric things like lighting design and special effects, you know, so haze, things like that. That's all at the world building. What is the atmosphere of the world around that action and the characters and how do we see and experience that as it relates to the story? Then the third layer of storytelling within film is our actual filming process itself, where we're going to take this three-dimensional world that we've created and we compress it into a two-dimensional image. And, right, so we're going to literally take out a dimension <laughs> and we're, and then that one is literally all about how we see and experience the characters through the camera lens and their world. It's about revelation of form. What of the world do we get to see? What of the world do we not get to see? Oh. Uh, uh, it's about how does that then help us tell the story and bring focus to what's important, as well as, you know, why are we choosing the, the shots we're choosing for our close-ups, for our mediums, for our wides, because of how they relate to the story? Because we tell stories about people, and we'll get into that in a second. Um, and so we, it's about our audience's relationship to the people and their world in order for them, for the audience to understand the context of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, then the fourth layer of storytelling is the assemblage. And that is the editing process, right? We're going to literally take everything we've created during the filming process, and we're now going to put it together in a way that creates relationships and is about juxtaposition and how are, you know, how are we moving from one place to the next? Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about film design, I'm literally meaning every aesthetic decision that you possibly could make in a moving image from layers two through four. That is the entirety of film design. And oftentimes when I talk about it, people think that I mean film design is solely and strictly the physical environment around the characters. And that's just one piece. Mm -hmm. And when we break it out, we look at those four layers, you can realize that the script is gonna have its ebbs and flows as it does. And the world around the characters that contains the action has its storyline that supports that narrative below right of the first layer and then the camera does the same thing and then the and the editing does the same thing they each address story in a very different way 
and also in a very similar way. They all utilize the five tenets of film design, which is color, uh, line and form, texture, scale and space, and movement. And so we they just do address them slightly differently at different spaces. And so understanding that is, that's what we have to understand in order to then be able to actually craft the film design and build the worlds that need to be built. Wow. Okay. So obviously, the, I mean, it's, it encompasses a lot. I mean, everything. So what, in this process, what, what are some of the, what, what makes it challenging? What are the challenges that arise? How does that affect storytelling? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So thank you for that. The, I think the biggest challenge is, look, we just covered a ton of stuff, right? As part of what film design is. And if you look at a script, scripts don't tell you any of that. <laughs> like the, they don't tell you anything. And I have a really great example that I do in my trainings of like, here's a script and like, let's talk about what's in the script and what it could be. And then how that changes the way we see and experience the action. And the reality is all those decisions. And I've even sat in writers workshops on they're like, oh, that's not our decision. That's the filmmaker's decision. So you don't even have to worry about putting in those details. And I was like, oh, that's exactly why it's so challenging for people to make these decisions. Because what people, I think the biggest uh, learning curve or maybe the, mm, mm, I don't want to say mistake because I literally think it's that people just don't even quite even realize it, is that there are so many decisions to be made based on a multitude of factors that often get forgotten or missed because people don't even realize they're supposed to ask them because they don't realize that you might see it in your head when you read it, but your creative team doesn't see it because there is nothing in the script to tell them what it looks like, right? This is why lookbooks are so important. This is why pitch decks are so important now because it's a couple reasons, but one of them is no one can get inside your head to understand where you want to go with your film because it can go in a lot of different directions. And I always say this at the beginning of my podcast of um, every movie and every TV show starts in the same place from the black void of camera lens. And there are infinite ways in which we can tell this story. And so the choices that you make as a filmmaker in the way in which you are going to go about telling it, the how you tell it, is where your creative voice gets heard. It's where your director's vision comes out to play. Mm -hmm. And there are easily a hundred decisions to be made for one scene. And if you wait until the very end of your prep process and wait until you get into pre-pro to start actually asking those questions, right. you've shortchanged yourself and you've, you have ended up wasting valuable time mm -hmm. and it just adds a layer of during the actual process of filming which is really important whether you're doing a pilot or a series or a feature or even just something for online content if you are focused on the what is the world of our story now that we're like a week out and what's the world and what are the characters and what are we doing you're not able to be as agile and nimble in the actual filming process to be present with your work. Absolutely. And that is the moment when you are on set that you want to be fully present with what you're creating and what you're doing with the cast and what you're doing and why you're choosing what you're choosing. And so um, I think that's why film design is so challenging is because there are a lot of decisions and questions to be asked that people don't tend to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, it's an amazing because I feel like they don't even know that they're supposed to ask it, which is has been shocking for me as a film designer because they're, that's what I was taught. It was like, how do you know, these are the questions you ask and this is why you ask them. Yeah. And it's, it's clear that, I mean, all of those things leading up, it's, it's of the utmost importance. So it's definitely, you know, something that needs to be addressed well beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what, it, 
in terms of these concepts and, and all of the design and all of the elements and the decisions, what is the cognitive science behind those concepts? Yeah, huge fan of cognitive science um, and just in general, right? I think we need to understand as storytellers why people listen to stories, why we tell stories. And um, because if you go, and why we're telling a story at this time, I mean, there are hundreds of rom-coms, for example, right? Boy meets girl or a girl meets boy or girl meets girl. What I mean, whatever the gender preferences are there. And they we tell a story um, and yet there are, there are hundreds and thousands of movies and shows and all these things around these things. And yet, um, right. So why, why do we keep coming back? And the cognitive, there's a lot of reasons behind the cognitive science of storytelling. One of which is we use stories as a way of emulating life and getting, uh, basically as a way of looking at how might I respond in the future to a situation that I don't necessarily know or understand. Mm -hmm. And in that, I will say that that also goes to how do we experience groups of people in a, and environments and the way that we might navigate around those or what that world is like. And we utilize that. So that is one of the reasons why storytelling is extremely important and has a huge responsibility. First off on that, just talking about the responsibility we have as a filmmaker in telling these stories, because this is what storytelling does, is create a bridge for people into the unknown of what they don't know or haven't experienced, we get to be very mindful with of how we represent situations and people. Um, the other cognitive science piece of it and the piece that kind of relates a lot to, to what we do with design is that we as humans, we don't like open loops. This is why people get really frustrated with like an open ending of a film. We want everything to be packaged in a certain way. Even optically, we have that experience of what are called closure lines, where if we see five, you know, four dots, uh, they will be like, oh, they're a square. Because our brain goes, closure lines, we got to close this off. And that goes with storytelling too. And what we're looking, when we look at uh, the choices around the characters of how are they dressed? What's the environment in which they are doing having the action in? why are we shooting them in, in the way that we're shooting them? And and the way that this these edits are happening, is it a fast pace, slow pace? What are the, you know, those cuts? All of those elements are part of raw data that is information that our audience is looking at to decipher where we're going because they want to close those story loops mm -hmm. and they want to anticipate what's happening next. And then Lisa Cron's book, Wired for Story, she goes deep into this. But the basic thing that you need to understand is that Everything around us tells a story of who we are, what our belief systems are. You know, we make, we make, I want to say I'm going to, I feel like I have the number wrong in my head at the moment, but we make judgments on over 12 categories of a person within the first five seconds of, or less of seeing them. That is first impressions. Yeah. This is why you only have one shot for a first impression. And when you're talking character design, that is all your first impressions, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, when you were talking about the context of a world and the world in which a scene takes place, let's say we're in an empty space and our first introduction to the character is we're waiting in the space and then we watch them come in. We're looking at the space to go, what is this environment? What does it tell us about the story and, and who might be coming into the space and why? And those are all the questions our audience is asking without us ever putting a single word on the page. Literally, the scene could just say it. The line on the page is interior Joe's apartment, yeah. and that is what we're starting to ask all these questions about. So that's the cognitive science behind what we do as filmmakers and what we do as visual storytellers that affects the way that our audiences perceive and see these worlds that we're creating. And so you want to start thinking about why are we telling the story in this way? Uh, on a note, on that, there's. Um, Laura Zucola is a, an executive coach for like speeches. And she did a Ted talk on how to have a great speech where people remember your name. And in her speech, she talked about, and this will relate back to film design and filmmaking. She talks about how, um, when they did a test in a survey of a speaker of when people believed them to be genuine and when they did not, they asked them, what was it? And 80%, 80% of the people, roughly said that it was basically the way they said it right 
the in, intonation in their voice and their physical appearance, like their body language on set and, or on stage. And that was what made them believe that what they were saying was genuine. Wow. Only like 6%, I think it was, I have to look at my data again, but only like a small portion actually listened to the words and said that the words were what, what told the story, convinced them of this person's genuineness, right? Right. When we take that into consideration, and I love it, you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> when we take that into consideration and we think about what, you know, she says, oftentimes people sit and worry about every single line. Mm. right in their speech they go on every single line and then they wing the execution the execution the how you say it is the most important part of the entire process of delivering any sort of story mm -hmm. and so when we take that into consideration and we think about the film design right those layers two through four that is literally the how you say it you can have the most amazing script it can have every Thing perfect in every beat and moment. And I will tell you from personal experience of working on multiple films where the script was amazing and yet the execution fell massively short. Mm. And what was, and, and that could be at any level. Yeah. I've done, I did one film that was heartbreaking. I knew what we caught on set. I was amazed. I couldn't believe it. And the heart, I mean, I, the amount of hard work that we all did because we believed in the film and then seeing the edit and how it was edited because they didn't want to spend money on another ed on an editor or whatever was going on. Yeah. The edit ruined it all. And the entire crew, and I haven't talked to the cast about it, but the entire crew, not even a joke, entire crew is extremely upset about what happened to their work. Right. And so, yeah. and the, and the magic of what the script was got lost because it wasn't handled appropriately. Right. So it is the how you say it that is a part of what matters in terms of making sure that the amazingness that is your story that you have spent months crafting actually gets heard and seen in the way that you want, especially yeah. because in film and television, we get one shot to shoot it, shoot something. Yeah. We will never get an opportunity to, to redo it. Unlike theater, where if a playwright show fill, um, script doesn't work they get to workshop it they get to remount it again and change it there yeah. is it can get better right you don't get that opportunity in film and television and so you really have to spend the time in advance thinking about this stuff before mm -hmm. you start pulling the trigger yeah. because it's so much about the way the audience is going to enter your story another piece of cognitive science behind that is that we believe in tangibility as people and we need our worlds the worlds of our story to be tangible and so in lisa cron's book she talks about it for writers of prose writing but if we think about it from our sense and we translate that into filmmaking that's really then becomes what is the what are all the aesthetic choices we're making and how do they serve the story from that wow so just, actually um it's fascinating um and it segues perfectly into this next question, which is how does this work impact the production budget? And I mean, yeah. you know, from pre-production, before pre-production, through production and post-production. Yeah, uh, great question. So the way that this work impacts your budget is in a couple ways. So one, my experience has been most indie films actually don't know what they need monetarily to make their film happen. Mm -hmm. And they go, well, I, this seems like, and I, this seems like this should be enough. Right. Uh, seems like is never an accurate way of budgeting and will always <laughs> leave you wondering where all the money went. Um, and also, I mean, and I think we have to be mindful as, as creatives. I mean, I remember I was in an event and someone was like, well, I raised a hundred thousand dollars. I was like, well, you're doing a film that's set in the medieval era in New York, which is going to make it a little more costly if yeah. you want to have it be a specific. Right. And so not that you can't be, I, I highly recommend trying to get some more funding. And she was like, well, I've never even had a hundred thousand dollars before. So it just seems like a lot of money. Uh, we have to be really careful of those perceptions that we have around that because that doesn't always serve us. So that's one thing. And, uh, the other thing is 
when you actually budget based on what you need for your film, you a couple things happen. One, when you figure this out and you can go to an investor and say, hey, we need $450,000 to make this feature, this series, and here's why. And this is the stuff we're going to use and why it's a non-negotiable storytelling tool. This is how, you know, we really think we're, we're craft, trying to craft something here that is unique and specific. And this is how that serves us and where that money goes. People go, oh, okay. If it's, when it's just a giant number, people don't quite understand. And, and so that's one of the things I think it helps you articulate. And that just helps you with the, like, I can actually tell you why we're making these decisions. So it'll help you with, I think, you know, I believe that it helps you to then articulate your vision to investors. Mm -hmm. And when you're raising funds to better support your story, because you can enroll them in why you're telling the story you're the way you're telling it and what you need and why you need it. The other reason why this supports is I, we often hear this in terms of like um, time management as an analogy, right? So we take a jar and we have a jar and that is our time, right? Well, in this case, the jar is our budget and our, we've got rocks. We've got, um, we've got rocks. We've got as our big ideas, our big creative moments, we have the smaller creative moments of pebbles and smaller rocks. And then we've got the sand, right? Which is all the uh, basic stuff and basic coverage. If we take that sand and we fill our jar with the sand first, we have nothing in our jar, our creative jar and our creative budget to set us apart as filmmakers, mm. right? We're budgeting for all cases, which is great. But then also you you don't allow yourself room for the things that are special and unique about your story. And so what you want to do when you're looking at the budget and what working on your creative vision in advance allows you to do is figure out what are your storytelling non-negotiables? Mm. What are your five moments or in your pilot that must be told in a, or in a specific way in order to really sell that moment. Right. And then when we come from it at that point, we go, then we're filling our budget with what do we actually need based on the story and go, okay, these are our five most important moments. Here's what those need financially to make happen. Mm. And then we go, okay, what do we have left? All right, well, we've got room for a little more so we can start putting in some of the other bigger ideas and then we can put in the sand that fills in and we'll continue, right? All of that will just kind of like fill in the space between. And again, if we think about, you know, how you tell the story is what people listen to and you want to tell stories that you that set you apart from everyone else right you have to come from it from a story the story's perspective of what's the most important moment in the story and then put your budgeting and resources towards that mm -hmm. because spending fifteen thousand dollars can be done in a lot of different ways yeah. and if you know and i on a film that i did actually in minnesota um up by duluth nice. i did um coming out, I think 2023, very excited. Uh, this, in this film, we, there was a character that was really important to the storytelling. And there was a coat that I designed from scratch and had built. I spent 25% of my entire budget on this one character. There were much more than four characters in the story and four outfits. I spent 25% on this character because it was about the storytelling impact of that design. Mm -hmm. And I made adjustments elsewhere based on that going, okay, I know I can thrift things. I know that I can get things at a discount, um, you know, and buy things on sale so I can shift things around mm -hmm. to support this, to stay in budget, yeah. to stay within the world that we're talking about. And that is the difference between going, going, what do we need? versus mm. what can we afford? Right. And so I think oftentimes people think that great film design comes from only comes from money. Great film design comes from deliberate choices that are made in service of the narrative. And that can mean a lot of different things depending on the type of story that you're telling. Yeah. And so that's, that's my, how I look at this affecting the way that it affects budget. Uh, it also, when you know what you want, you spend less time on set shooting things that you're going to throw away anyways. Yeah. You spend, which also then means you have less time in post on wasted material. It's when you know what you want, 
you can then also say, hey, editor or color corrector, this is where we want to go. What do you need in order for that to be possible? Exactly. And then that in and of itself saves you time on the back end and it'll save you finances on the back end because something that could have been fixed on set or handled during the production process now has to be fixed in post and that's going to take more time and more money and it never is going to be as inexpensive as people think it's going to be. Right. You know, and there's only so much you can do with an image if you've ever gone through and played with, all right, let's play with the, uh, the hue and saturation of this, of this scene at a certain point, the color blows out in weird ways and you lose things. That's a fact. What you <laughs> capture is what you capture. You can't suddenly go, this is my frame. If I can figure out with my iPad, right? This is our frame. <laughs> and then like, we're going to move it this way. Oh no, right. we can't because we, this is what we got. So right. what you have is what you have. <laughs> what you have is what you have. And so, you know, and one of the things I always go to is talking about, budget, if you waste time, if, calculate how much an hour of time on set that is wasted, not capturing footage costs you. Right. Because if you're debating whether or not you should have an extra set of hands or two, and you realize that the, the difference is the same price of if we waste an hour, it's the day rate for an extra set of hands, hire that extra set of hands. Exactly. Because uh, I will tell you from experience, I got, uh, I took over a feature on the first week of uh, filming, a designer walked. I was asking for additionals the entire time because I was like, I'm literally missed out on all the prep and I'm jumping in and literally designing on the fly, which I am very proud of what I created on the fly. <laughs> and, but I held up set. And if they had actually listened to me and they were fine with it because they understood and it was made the film better but if they had listened to me they could have had they would have saved money and we wouldn't have we wouldn't have wasted time we wouldn't have been waiting on certain times because yeah. i would have had somebody who was able to dedicate their entire time to building and altering the things that needed to be built and altered because yeah. this film was very much a custom build film yeah and so you know so those are the things of start to ask yourself when you're budgeting what you you know what it'll cost because Oftentimes people go, we can't afford this. And then I go, but you can afford OT. So if you can, if you've budgeted in for an hour and a half of OT every day or two hours of OT after the 12, right? Then if you have something that could, if, if hiring one person saves you exactly. that hour and a half of OT, that is worth it. And so right. that's the stuff that I go, those are just some of the ways. And when you know what you need, and one of the things I cover in my course is how do you actually look at making sure you have enough crew on the day and to be ready for when your people are going to say, Hey, I, we're going to need an extra set costume or we're going to need an extra hair person or we're going to need an extra makeup person to get people through the works. Because, um, look, I'm a firm believer that when you're on set, the thing that you want to focus on is the image you're capturing and the performances that you're making. So right. anything that keeps the actors and the director from being on set to rehearse the scene, to work through it, for the DP and the crew to see what we're actually crafting and creating to then be able to respond to what is being made and what's coming up is a disservice yeah. and is a distraction. And so the goal is to do this work in advance so you can spend less time wasted on set because that is the most expensive time in your production process. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, and so, I mean, you've kind of just touched on this, um, but and, and a little bit earlier. So what do you think, or why do you think uh, creators or producers will, will skip this entirely or just sort of like gloss over it? And obviously, you know, we know what that does to the final product, but is it a lack of knowledge or funding? Is it both generally, or what, what are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say it's a lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, because if you have been putting together a film on your own without being paid, like, yes, pay and is a part of it. Mm -hmm. And yes, if we have money for development, then that allows us more time to focus on the thing we're making. So yes, money is a piece of it. I'm not saying it's not, but I'm actually going to argue that people don't realize the process. Right. If you look at the four, at the four layers of storytelling within film, you will see that world building is the second layer. Yeah, That's not happenstance. <laughs> that is by important, by what has to be asked first 
where, what happens first? All of your production design and costume design happens before you ever get on set. And one of the things that I've noticed is people wait until casting to start designing. Your world is the world of your story, regardless of who your cast is. They are coming into it and you are much better off making adjustments based on a specific cast member or casting choice than you are of waiting for the entire thing to be thought about until you've gotten casting. Right. And when you want to bring in talent and talent is more than just actors, talent is your design department, you know, your costume designer, your makeup artist, your hairstylist, your production designer, they are talent. They bring things to the table that will open up your eyes to the story you are telling. They will help you with resources you don't have. They are talent. If you get someone who is well connected to join your film because they believe in the vision that you have, they bring all their resources. I mean, my the amount of times that I've been able to borrow from shows that I worked on to be able to do a friend's short or the fact that I own a costume rental house and was able to bring literally 10 racks of costumes to a film, which is a value of about $70,000 in rentals. Yeah. Right. That is talent. That is value brought to the table. And so when you know your creative vision sooner and you bring that in um, and you are able to articulate it to even them, you have the ability to get better talent. And most people aren't going to read your script. That's a fact. They're not going to read your script first before they decide whether or not they're going to do it. They're going to look at your pitch materials. They're going to skim. We don't read. Look at how you go through websites. Do you even read the website right. from top to bottom or do you skim it and then decide whether or not you want to read it? Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. We skim. And so when you have really good visuals, and I'll tell you this from my own personal experience, um, I've always been pretty into the way that I present my work. And so even my physical portfolios were very intentional. And I looked to capture the intentionality of the story in my portfolio and the way that I presented the work um, when I was doing physical portfolios. I had the privilege of getting to meet a Tony and Olivier award-winning lighting designer. This was back when I still did theater. And I will never forget how he literally was like, wow, I didn't even think I'd be so interested in what you did because it's costumes and I'm interested in lighting. He goes, I just spent an hour looking through your stuff. And it had to do with the way I told the story through the pages of my portfolio. And suddenly I got the buy-in of a big designer who otherwise didn't really think much of me. And so, <laughs> you know, you just don't know you just, it's just, it's very important to buy, bring people into the worlds of our stories and the worlds of what we see and to be excitable about what it is we're doing. And it's really hard to say, look, what kind of, when you say it's a blue world, what kind of blue? Is it a purple blue or is it a green blue? Is it a cold blue or a warm blue? Is it a, um, or is it a royal blue? Is that the baseline? What is the, when we say it's a blue world, what kind of blue? Right. When we say it's a cold world, what kind of cold is it? Is it, um, when we say it's a monochromatic world, is it that it's literally black and white grayscale, or is it that it's on a tonal scale of a specific hue? There mm -hmm. are a lot of different ways of breaking this down and out and visuals are super important. And, um, I just think that people literally don't realize the value and importance that this brings to the storytelling. Look, Look at the cosplay market, right? The character creation and character design is what we are seeing happen every day that we are at a, any sort of Comic-Con or convention of any kind. It is right. about that design, those characters, the intentional choices that the actors and the, I mean, the actors are a huge part of it. That's why I love costume design. You get to, you get to work with the actors to create a character. They get to embody it, but the design team is who helps execute it and make sure that it is there for the entirety. And that's what draws people in. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why Wes Anderson films are, are referenced in interior design because it's a very specific aesthetic right. and people go how to have Wes Anderson style interior design, which is really how to have the design aesthetic of his designers. Um, but to have that, that style, 
and how to make that happen in your in your house, right? That is that is about drawing people into our stories and connecting with them on a way that brings our stories in, into into our cultural existence. Yeah. And I think that's uh, and imp- really important because we exist. Last part of this, uh, I always tell people we're echoes of the past that reverberate into the future. We exist on a continuum as filmmakers and as creatives. And so we are influenced by what has come before us and we will then go out and um, our work will reverberate. We have no idea how or why or when it will affect people, but it will. And we are a part of that. And so being aware of that, I think is also really important. Yeah. I'm just so, I'm so glad to sort of be shedding light on, on this because it's clearly such an invaluable process and, and part of, you know, the, world of creating and it's just I'm, I'm just i'm glad to know and and how much it can inform what you do and doing the work ahead of time can ultimately help you in the long run and you know in all aspects and in, in terms of your budget in terms of the store in terms of all of these things feeding into the whole like how invaluable this process is so that said so thank you <laughs> um and also, is this, you know, kind of what we were just talking about, like why people sort of skip over this or why they don't have, that they don't have this knowledge or that they don't have, you know, this understanding. Is that what prompted you to create your masterclass or was it something else? And I, your love of what you do. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I do love what I do. And so that's part of it. I go, but it's really the fact that it's missing from the industry. Mm-hmm. I When we look at the information that's both online and through film schools, what they teach you is here's the technical of how you can use a camera. Here is what the, uh, here's what it means to be a director sort of, because again, they don't teach you about design and your job as a director by definition is to delegate, right? You are directing the conversation. You are directing the choices. And so the fact that they don't, teach that as a problem, right? But film schools focus on the director, the producer, the writer, the cinematographer, and the actor. That's it, right? Which is basically everybody above the line. Right. And what we're missing then is all the understanding of what actually goes into crafting the world. And there's this, there's this mentality out there that there's two different mentalities. One of them is that you're not going to have but money. So it isn't worth teaching you in film school. So there's no valuing of it on that level, which is a a huge, huge, oh my God, huge. (laughs) And this is where I get really upset. It's a huge undercut for film in early career filmmakers. Cause here's the reality. We just talked about the cognitive science behind world building and storytelling and why it matters, right? Just a few minutes ago. By saying that it doesn't matter, and I'm not even kidding you when I tell you that I've been in film school grad programs in conversation to guest speak on this, and people go, well, you know, they're getting ready to do their thesis film, but there's only a couple people in it, so it's really not that big of a deal. They don't need designers. It's a small film. And I'm like, what? (laughs) Wait a second. (laughs) No. Okay. Here's why. (laughs) Like, this has nothing to do with my own personal opinion of why I think what I do is amazing and valuable. This has to do with literal cognitive science. Right. What you're doing and what they did is undercut the entire filmmaking process for these filmmakers. Because the reality is film design is not a luxury, especially world building. It is not a luxury. It is a part of creating the visual con, the context of the story, the unspoken context that tells our audience where we are who they are, what their relationship, these characters' relationships are to one another, what their their relationships are to the world around them based on their design and the world's design and the way we we show it through the camera. That is not throwawayable. And when you are the director of a film and you cannot, or producer, and you cannot afford to hire the experts, you are still responsible to craft that world. Right. Right. So not knowing is not an excuse to not do it. Mm. Or not having the team is not the excuse to not do it. Right. And if you want people to be engaged in your stories, we connect to thing, worlds that are tangible. That is a cognitive science fact. It has nothing to do with my opinion. It has everything to do with the science. Yeah. And so when we understand that, 
you go, this isn't invalid. This is, this is important information that we have to then look at and learn and understand. Mm -hmm. And I basically started, I started writing my own stuff because I wanted to tell stories and I wanted to go into worlds that I was interested in. And that was what it was. I wanted to tell stories in worlds that made me excited. And I started meeting filmmakers and they would tell me how they didn't even know how to start the conversation. So, you know, back in 2014, eight years ago now, I started telling people, well, you got to put together a lookbook. You got to start thinking about your world because it'll inform the story you tell because they're, they're intertwined. Right. And it became this kind of double-edged thing of filmmakers telling me, well, no one's ever taught us this and we don't know how to go about this conversation. And designers going, I don't understand why people don't, filmmakers don't understand how to talk to us. Right. And I was like, well, they don't know. They're telling me they don't know. And you're telling me that you don't understand why they don't know. So clearly this information is missing and we have to put this into the world. And so that was what prompted me to make my course. Right. And it is very much a step-by-step, -step, like all the questions you might ever have to ask about um, a world you get with it. Um, there's a process of how you break out the worlds to understand the relationships because everything is about relationships, right? We, we live in a world where it's a, how do we relate to the world we live in? And we choose yeah. the cities we want to live in based on how we relate to space, mm -hmm. how we relate to the people that are there. You know, it's, we can go into like how that's part of the way that our country's becoming siloed in certain ways because we move to places based on the cultures that's there and the way that it allows us to be in the space, right? If you like, if you don't like driving, you're going to live in a city like New York or Chicago or San Francisco where you can, where there's public transportation and you can walk. Um, that's a world choice. Right. And so that's, those are just some of the, like, we live in this. And so I think it also then gets... Um, it gets overlooked because it seems so obvious. And then even though it's not. Right. Absolutely. Um, so what, to finish it off, what is the number one thing that people need to know to effectively world build? Just the, the top. Um. I really thought I was gonna have a different answer for this. I will say <laughs> when I was thinking about the question that I was like, oh, I know what this answer is. The number one thing to effectively world build is to ask yourself what's actually in the script. Mm. Not what you think is there, not what you want to be there, what is actually there. Mm -hmm. And then how do you serve that? And I always tell people there are three most important questions to ask. Uh, why this story at this time for this audience? What is it that you want them to get away, take away from this? Mm -hmm. Is it an understanding, a new perspective, a sense of hope? Whatever it is, be really clear on the intentionality behind this. And then why are you interested in telling this story? What is it about this story that piques your curiosity and your interest? There's been a lot of conversations about passion versus curiosity. Passion ebbs and flows. Curiosity is consistent. And when we stay curious, it allows us to explore and we'll find other answers. And so it's about, and the other thing is every project is its own thing. So we have to come at every film and every show with the beginner's mindset. And there's some brain science behind that. When we say, I don't know, our brain, our left and right, so our left and right brain, they don't typically communicate back and forth right. until we're in a place of curiosity, right? So if we've ever walked into a room and we're like, all of a sudden you feel like uh, all your senses go up because you're like, I'm at a networking event and okay, who's here, what's here? Like, I gotta, you know, I got to get my groundings and you're like, oh, my brain's on fire and you can feel yeah. everything, paying attention to everything, right? You're, yeah. have, all your senses are heightened. That's because your left and right brain are coming from, okay, what's going on here? And right. so they're talking back and forth. As soon as we say, I know, you know, or you can experience this, right? When we walk into a restaurant to find our friends, everything's going off. And then mm -hmm. as soon as we find our friends, 
our brain shuts down. That is that moment when our this, the conversation between the left and right brain sever. And as soon as that happens, our ability to be cre to create and to for possibility goes down. Mm -hmm. And so when we come in from a beginner's mindset with every project, it allows us that opportunity to continue to be in a space of growth and to continue to, to ask questions. And that's uh -oh. does is it keeps you interesting. What else about that? And so that's the that's, I think, the long number one thing to think about. Oh my gosh. Sarah, thank you. This has been so fantastic. I'm so glad to get to talk to you about this, to, you know, to share this with our audience, um, what, you know, what this is, what you do, how important this is, and how this can really inform your storytelling. Um, thank you so much for taking time with us. Yeah. And please, Keep us posted on the film coming out in 2023. I'm definitely interested to check that out. And on yeah, your other as well. Thanks. I'm excited about the I'm excited about this one. It was shot up in uh, Minnesota and um and I and it was a great experience. So I just I have a very big love for Duluth and that area. So I'm like, anyone listening, please go. Go up there, go shoot up there. It is Yes. It is awesome. It really <laughs> so, is. It's a gem. It's 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 incredible. And I can't wait for more people to 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 realize that and to get up there and 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 make their make, make their stories. Yeah. Um well thank you so much. I won't keep you any longer. I appreciate you being here and uh look forward to talking to you again. Thanks, same. I love this. This is awesome. Brought to you by the Catalyst Story Institute.